Cool. So um, for a long time now, I've, I've always advocated and encouraged people that, you know, if you spend a weekend or a few hours uh, researching a topic um, and you find, find the answers that you're looking for, that it's always just a great idea to, um, to share that. Like you don't need to do anything too fancy. You don't need to go over the top. Um, so this is, this is actually practicing what I preach. This is something that I fell down a hole last week trying to solve. Um, and over the weekend, I ended up writing a very small uh, Swift tool to, to solve this for me. So this is me sharing the, what I've learned over the last week. So if we go back a little bit, uh, in the beginning, there was Swift. Um, and it wasn't really good back in those days. I know I kind of look back at them with, with rose-colored glasses every now and then um, with a little bit of nostalgia, but it really actually wasn't, wasn't that good. It was still very much a preview, kind of like, um, like Swift UI is these days. Um, but it got better. Um, it got heaps better. Like oh, they did 24 releases over five years. Not all of those were for Mac OS and iOS. A lot of that was for Linux support. Um, but it, it really did get better. We got some great new features. We got uh, multi-platform support. We got like codable, all those sorts of things. Um, and I think most people agree that from about Swift 4, 4 onwards, it was pretty much ready for prime time. Like there was nothing you couldn't, couldn't do with it. And then Swift 5 came along last year. Um, and prior to Swift 5, all of your apps would ship with a copy of the Swift language runtime and the, um, and the Swift core libraries all embedded inside your app, your app binary. You know, that was mostly to preserve compatibility between the versions. So that regardless of what version you um, built your, your app in, it would run on that OS. As of Swift 5.0, we got uh, ABI stability, which means now that you don't necessarily have to ship your, your app with um, the Swift runtime is built in anymore. You can use the operating systems copy and they can guarantee that that will work regardless of the Swift version that you built with. Um, from Swift 5.1, we can now actually, if we choose to, we can adopt that behavior for our own frameworks as well. And that's a little bit what this is. Coming as well this year, um, we've already seen the Swift evolution proposals for this, um, is binary target support. So if we have a quick look at what that actually means, uh, in your Swift package, um, and you can see it here mainly in the middle, um, in your Swift package, you can now, instead of providing the GitHub repo, you can provide a URL to the compiled source um, and a checksum for safety. And then it will, Swift package manager will go out download it, um, load it up inside the Swift package itself, and then present it to, to your Xcode projects as part of itself. It, it takes care of all of the, I'm sure a lot of developers are familiar with the runtime search path and the framework search paths and all of those sorts of problems that we've had over the years. Swift Package Manager takes care of that for us. Um, but the, the big caveat with this, of course, is that it's called a binary target, not a binary dependency because when you ship a binary package, you're opting out of Swift's dependency resolution. So you have to manage it all yourself. Okay. Um, so just a quick thing on terminology because this is called a few things when you try and search for it. Um, binary targets end up being basically XC frameworks. Um, and they're also known as Swift binary frameworks, whatever language you want to use. But really, um, at the end result is a XE framework, which is a directory that mirrors very closely to the original frameworks that we're used to. And you can see there's a link at the bottom of the screen there that has um, the WWDC talk from last year on this, which I really highly recommend. But the gap that Apple didn't address um, and that what this talk is about is how do we actually go about creating an XC framework? So like there's no real documentation on this. There's no step-by-step -step how you do this. It's something that you just kind of need to feel your way through a little bit. Um, so this is basically to, to sum up the journey that I've been on in the last week, the research that I've done and that sort of thing. And we're going to do this with a demo. So hopefully this is all working. Um, 
going to do my test with just the Swift log package, nice and clean. We can see here that um, it's a got a single product, um, which is a logging framework, single target called logging. So the first step we do for this is because this is all built into everyone's favorite Xcode build, we need an Xcode project. So Swift thankfully will do that for us. Now the next step then is to, whoa, that didn't work. Copy and paste failed. Um, so we need to build our Xcode project. Um, so we're gonna build the login target, release configuration. We're gonna build the Mac OS first. And then this part is the key. Um, if you set build library for distribution to yes, it will produce the Swift module and the Swift interface files for your Swift target, which then means that we can then turn it into a XE framework later on. Nope, Xcode build. Let's copy that again. That looks better. The joys of live demos. Um, so nothing new there. We've gone and we've created a um, a logging dot framework. So if we have have a quick look at that, um, our logging framework is a sixty four bit dynamically linked shared library for x eighty six. So that's good. That's exactly what we want from a Mac OS project. We can then do the same for iPhone OS. Is next. Should play some hold music. We have a look, inspect that quickly, the iPhone OS one. Um, we can see that by default it's built for ARM v7 and ARM64. Um, Swift and the Xcode build will respect when you generate that project if you've set it for a minimum of uh, iPhone or iOS 13 it will only generate the ARM64 slice. It doesn't generate the ARM v7 anymore because it's not supported on any devices. And last but not least, we need to go and build for the iPhone simulator because there's nothing worse than trying to run um, ARM code on your iPhone simulator and finding out that it's just not gonna work. Cool. So that's it, we've built our three slices that we want for this framework. The final step then is to use the new uh, create XC framework command in Xcode build. Um, use but pass in all of the frameworks that you've just built and you throw it out into where you want your XC framework to be. That'll be very quick. Um, so we can then go and have a look at this. Can't really zoom this very well, but where is it? Logging.exe framework. So you can see here that it has, it has the three slices that we've already built. So it just copies the existing framework inside it. And then it has just a plist that identifies the string that, does, that it needs to find, um, your list of supported architectures, the platform, and in the case of the simulator, the variant on that platform. And that's it. Um, the problem really with this is that it gets very messy very fast, um, especially when you're building for iOS, tvOS, watchOS, macOS, like this gets really, really hectic really fast. Um, so on the weekend, I knocked up a very quick um, Swift tool, which is the last part of this demo, um, called Create XC Framework, which then you just specify the products that you want to build. Um, and the good thing about this is because we're wrapping a, um, an Xcode project file, we can actually build all of our dependencies in one go. We don't have, just have to build the products that we, we deal with. Um, so just to show you how fast that works, when you do it, whoop, uh, XCButify, things cross this works. Cool, so it, it, the script just cleans it and then builds for every um, every platform that you choose to support and you can choose that 
on the command line which ones you want to build for. I love, 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 love the Xcode build warnings when you have a device plugged in. Oops. So if we have a look at our logging .xt framework now, we can see that it's built for iOS, macOS, tvOS, watchOS, so on and so forth. Um, and we've built i38.6 simulators, we've built ARMv7K, we've built everything. That's all taken care for you by Xcode. Um, and then to use this, which is the part I didn't actually do in the demo, from Xcode 11 onwards, um, I've only tested with 11.4, but it should be 11 onwards. You can just drag your XC framework into your Xcode project, the same as you would any other, any other framework or that sort of thing. Um, and it will just pick it up and, and run with it. And as far as I can tell from my testing, the old adage of where we need to um, remove slices, like if you've ever used Carthage, the, the strip frameworks part step isn't actually required, but I haven't found confirmation of that anywhere. I just, in my testing, it hasn't, hasn't been necessary. So that's it. If you wanted to have a look at that, um, I've thrown it up on GitHub. My ultimate intention for this is to turn it into a GitHub action that you can just attach to um, your own Swift packages. And every time you tag a release, it just compiles the XE framework, dumps it up on the, um, as part of the GitHub release. That's the next step. But that's everything that I have. Um, Hugh, did you want to take it back from here? I'll be around for questions after this on Slack, of course.